Good morning. I'm Linda Marban. Uh, I wanted to thank the Alliance for hosting this fabulous meeting. Over the years, I continue to see this audience grow, and it's very reassuring to see how many people are truly interested in this exciting space in the field. We're a publicly traded company, and I'm sure I'll make statements that uh, my legal counsel will groan over, so uh, please don't hold me to them. A brief overview of the company is uh, shown here. Uh, we have a cardiosphere derived cell, our CDC product. Uh, you've been hearing about this for a few years. First, it was the autologous product uh, that was the subject of the Caduceus trial that showed reduction in infarct size um, in patients with uh, post heart attack cardiac dysfunction. Um, that product is now um, an allogeneic product. It's in the all star clinical trial. You'll be hearing a lot more about that in the next few minutes. Um, in our developmental pipeline, we have an uh, exosome product. Um, our exosomes uh, were a situation where chance favored the prepared mind. Uh, we were looking for the mechanism of action of our cells and discovered this very exciting uh, regenerative uh, platform technology called an exosome. And then we have our Senderotide program, which I won't be talking to you about today because it's a peptide used to treat advanced heart failure. Uh, that program is... Um, one in which we inherited uh, when we became a public company and is not a regenerative therapeutic. Um, we've brought in $39.5 million in non-dilutive capital since our inception. Uh, we've been able to, to really take advantage of, of all the good sources, including uh, the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, uh, which has funded our phase uh, two clinical trial. Heart disease remains the number one killer. Um, I think all of you agree that it is a huge unmet medical need. It's why so many people, especially those uh, in the regenerative medicine space, are looking for opportunities uh, in which to treat this uh, very um, significant unmet uh, medical need uh, with a huge cost to the American population. $8 billion was spent just last year alone. So the, the disease process that we're looking to treat is the development of uh, ischemic heart failure. When a patient has a heart attack, uh, tissue dies downstream. Ultimately, the heart then enters into a process which we call adverse remodeling. Adverse remodeling is the changing of the dimensions of the heart in response to the injury. Two things happen when this occurs. One, you have a reduction in cardiac function, that is the ability of the heart to contract efficiently to deliver blood to the body. And two, you have um, increased load on the remaining muscle, leading to um, tragic things like arrhythmias, which can uh, kill a patient immediately or ultimately, both of which can lead to the development of heart failure. Shown in the far right is a patient that has advanced heart failure patient can't breathe very well, they're tired, they're at high risk for hospital admission and have a five-year, 50% mortality. We're using our cell therapeutic, uh, the CDC, to treat uh, both phases of this process, both the adverse remodeling, which is the changing of the dimensions of the heart, and also that patient that has advanced heart failure in an effort to uh, restore the functional capacity of this patient and reduce major adverse cardiac events. Our product is CAP1002. It's made by taking cardiac tissue. We then mince it using a proprietary process into explants. We ultimately go through cell culture processes that lead to the cardiosphere-derived cell. The dose that we are currently using, uh, infusing down intracoronary artery, the infarct-related artery, is 25 million cells. The cells uh, largely function in many ways. They reduce uh, apoptosis, that's programmed cell death, when a a cell feels like it no longer has a good function in the body, it tells itself to die, and that's uh, the scientific word, apoptosis. Um, it promotes natural cardiomyocyte proliferation and angiogenesis, so our cells don't go in and engraft and make the heart their new home. They go in and they release a lot of factors, including microRNAs and paracrine factors, such as cytokines, that tell the heart that there's a problem and uh, recruits new cells to the area to help repair the injury that's occurred. To that end, uh, endogenous stem cells are attracted as well, and the cells have a, a very marked um, and measurable anti-scarring effect, um, anti-fibrosis uh, in the heart. <coughs> Excuse me. 
We have two clinical programs that are uh, currently underway. One is the all-star clinical trial. It's the one you're going to be hearing more about in the next few minutes. Uh, these patients that were treated uh, were either 30 days to one year after their heart attack. Um, the phase one is 14 patients. I'll be telling you a little bit about uh, that data uh, today. The phase two is underway, currently recruiting. Uh, we use single vessel intracoronary delivery. We estimate out the six-month data um, and 2016, so there's a secondary data point, uh, secondary endpoint is the six-month data, and uh, although the study is powered for one year. Um, the dynamic clinical trial I won't talk to you about today, it's for patients with advanced heart failure, uh, should be starting any time now. Uh, many of you know uh, that the cells have been subject to an option uh, to license by Janssen Biotech. Uh, several of my colleagues from Janssen are here in the audience, um, and I'm always glad to see them. Um, it uh, provides a significant opportunity downstream for Capricor, but perhaps more importantly is the collaboration that we're um, taking, uh, undertaking now to uh, get the cells ready for later stage clinical trials. Um, and uh, if they decide to exercise the option based on the six-month data, uh, they will um, likely be able to take over all the rest of the costs. So the All-Star is a phase one trial. Um, I won't go through the details here. Um, four subjects received 12 and a half million cells, 10 subjects received 25 million cells, uh, reduction in ejection fraction, and large heart attacks were required to cohorts. The phase one um, we looked at the immunology. This was the first time that an allogeneic cardio, um, cardiac derived cell had been injected into the heart, and we were able to see that there were no uh, immunologically significant events that occurred, so we were able uh, to successfully move on to phase two. However, we made some very interesting observations that I'm going to be sharing with you today. Shown here is the first set of data that we got. This was 10 patients that received the high dose. Um, we were gratified to see that just like uh, the Caduceus clinical trial, the patient saw a reduction in infarct size, but it wasn't to the level that we had seen in Caduceus, and uh, there were no changes in ejection fraction. Tyranny of small numbers, very small size trial, um, no control groups, so this is just data that we're using as a guidepost to take us through phase two. However, what we realized uh, relatively early on in the process is that there might be issues with donor-specific antibodies. So I don't have time to share with you today, but happy to share with you uh, in the uh, meetings outside the room uh, why we decided to look for donor-specific antibodies. But what we found is that if we actually screened out and only treated patients that did not have donor-specific antibodies, matched like you would do for tissue transplantation, then we saw um, a much different uh, paradigm. We saw um, starting to see increases in ejection fraction in patients that had been treated with the cells, and you can see the patient-by-patient -patient report there. Those patients that had lower ejection fractions had a marked improvement in their ejection fraction with a relative improvement on average of about 14%. And now we're seeing a very uh, strong uh, reduction in infarct size. So especially in that patient population with very large heart attacks, those at the greatest risk for developing heart failure, we saw um, a significant reduction in their scar size, suggesting it might move them from uh, potentially a high risk group for developing heart failure to a lower risk group. So we now um, have structured the phase two clinical trial um, such that uh, the we have what we call the randomized cohort. Uh, 260 patients will be matched, as in t with tissue type matching, and we'll do an exploratory cohort, not matching, in 40 patients for a total of 300 patients to see if these initial observations uh, were correct, that donor-specific antibodies seem to make a difference in the efficacy of an allogeneic cell product. Uh, the conclusion uh, of the phase one trial, which um, has been reported at TCT for more details, I think you can find that presentation online, um, is that we saw a, a significant scar size reduction and ejection fraction improvement in uh, the phase two equivalent population, and the phase two is currently enrolling. So now I'd like to, to switch gears a little bit and um, you know, just tell you that our, our cells are unique in the space. Uh, we are the only uh, regenerative therapy using a cardiac-derived cell that's allogeneic and intracoronary delivery for heart disease, and I think of it as, as a funnel uh, from which uh, we are the only potential uh, player in this particular um, area. 
So now I'd like to talk to you a little bit about exosomes. Exosomes are our new therapeutic. Uh, we've been talking about this a little bit. It's potentially a platform therapeutic, although we are initially pursuing it in the heart because that's, of course, our area of greatest bandwidth and um, KOLs. They are um, nanometer-sized lipid bilayer products. They're made by the cells themselves, um, basically using um, an, a process called endosomal fusion, so the cells recognize them as endogenous. It is a, a way of delivering microRNA. So, you know, microRNAs came on the, the field by storm. Everybody has a microRNA that cures some type of disease. We discovered uh, these exosomes um, from our CDCs, as I said, when we were looking for the, the MOA. And what we concluded is even though we found some microRNAs that are uh, delivering the punch, as we'll say, we felt that using the whole exosome packed with the natural uh, cocktail uh, was a far more powerful potential therapeutic. And additionally, the exosomes are very stable. stable. Um, they're uh, easy to deliver, and they're present in nearly all cell types and all bodily fluids. Shown here is a, a snippet of data just to, to whet your appetite for things to come. Again, using our model system, which is a uh, animal model of, of heart attack, uh, we were able to show that mice uh, treated with the CDC-derived exosome shown in the green bars um, had a significant improvement in ejection fraction over those treated with exosomes made from skin compared to those um, treated just with PBS. So the cardiac, the CDC-derived exosomes um, generated a, not only an improvement in cardiac function, but shown um, in the bar charts below as sort of our general measures of improvement, which is an increase in viable mass on the left and on the right. Um, I guess the opposite for you um, is scar mass, uh, those indicators which we've seen improvements in in humans. And what we can see is that the CDC-derived exosomes indeed reduce infarct size and uh, increase viable mass while also improving cardiac function. So we're moving on uh, to develop the exosomes. Uh, the preclinical work is continuing, uh, working also on uh, scaling up of manufacturing and, and the pre-commercial work, and we're targeting an IND in uh, 2015 uh, for, for a new indication of this product. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank you for your time today. Um, shown here are the, the people um, that make this happen and our uh, board of directors who um, have seasoned backgrounds in, in bringing uh, a variety of products uh, to commercialization and beyond. So thank you for your time, and we'll look forward to seeing you out there. <laughs>